All right, welcome. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, my name is Tuan Mai. I'm uh, the management coordinator and uh, physical therapist at the uh, Sports Medicine Center for Young Athletes at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital in Oakland. Um, I work at the Oakland site. We also have uh, sites in Walnut Creek and San Ramon. So um, I'm really excited for you all to come out today and um, see my presentation on Basketball Injury Prevention 101. Okay. Uh, so here's our three locations. And we provide uh, physical therapy services. Uh, we have uh, we work with area high schools uh, through an outreach program with the athletic training program, and we also um, have an athlete development program where we do sports performance training and group training and education. And we have a motion analysis lab, which I'll talk to you a little bit um, more about later, uh, which we do uh, both 2D and 3D uh, video analysis. So a lot of different options for you. So disclaimer, of course, uh, this is for general educational and informational purposes only. It is not medical advice and is not intended to replace consultation with qualified medical professionals regarding your specific circumstances. So the objectives today are to discuss common injuries unique to the youth basketball athlete, to explore the risk factors for youth basketball injuries, learn about proper jumping and landing mechanics for injury prevention, and to practice key exercises to improve your game. Okay, because that's one of the big things is, how do I get better at basketball? So, all the athletes here must have played at least some basketball or are interested in playing basketball. There's all these different activities that are involved in the game of basketball. You have to run, you have to jump, you have to jump off two legs, you have to jump off one leg, you have to land on two legs, you have to land on one leg. There's cutting, there's pivoting, there's shooting, there's dribbling. Okay, so wide variety of things. Not only that, you add on top of that, that there's other athletes that are randomly moving. You can't control them. So they're gonna bump you, they're gonna push you, they're gonna elbow you, they're gonna trip you, right? So all of those things on top of running, jumping, cutting, pivoting, okay, is going to affect how you move, all right? So uh, we'll talk about these things as we go along here. So the reason that we have this specialized program and we have a sports medicine center for young athletes is that young athletes are not miniature adults, okay? You look at Yao Ming over there, you cannot treat Yao Ming the same way that you treat a young female basketball athlete, okay? Because young athletes have open growth plates, okay? That means at the end of their long bones, there's open areas where the bone is still growing, okay? And because of those, uh, that area of growth, they're more susceptible to injuries in those, in those areas. And if you have injuries in those areas, it can actually change the growth and then cause you long-term disability, right? They vary in size and maturity. When I'm in the clinic, I see, I put two 10-year-olds next to each other, and one is five foot 10, and another one's four foot three. So how do you treat them the same way? Completely different. Yeah. You look at how mature they are, okay? How well they can respond to cueing, how well they can respond to coaching, and how much they can understand how their body moves. All right, and that's our job is to, is to help um, each individual athlete figure that out. They're developing neuromuscularly, right? So there are certain athletes that I say, you know, your foot's turned out and they have no idea what that means and they don't know how to fix it, okay? Versus I have other athletes that I say, you know, um, don't let your knees do this or, or don't let your foot do that. And then they're like, okay, I got it. And they just, and they can figure it out. Okay. So how the neuromuscular, so how the neuromuscular system responds to different stimuli is really important. Okay. And then the other thing is they have growing cartilage that is more susceptible to stressors. All right. So not only is there open growth plates, but the area where the muscles become tendon, the tendons attached to the bone, that area is cartilage and that 
can easily get damaged. So we'll talk about that again as we go through more of the injuries. So participation in injury rates, this is just for high school participants, but you can see almost a million high school participants in the US. And out of those high school participants, there's 1.94 injuries for every 1,000 athlete exposures. So an athlete exposure includes every time an athlete goes to practice and every time an athlete has a game. Okay? And you can imagine with your own athletes that how many times a week do you practice and play games? How many athlete exposures do you have in the course of a week? And you might have four or five exposures. Okay, multiply that by almost a million, all right, and then out of all those, there's about two injuries for every time there's a, uh, every thousand exposures. So we're talking about a lot of injuries here, and we see that in the clinic every day. You know, every day, new patients and former patients come back with varying injuries, all right? So we're going to look at where do basketball injuries occur? Okay. They occur in the head, face, and neck about 13% of the time. They occur in the arm and hand about 10% of the time. And then the big ones you're going to see are in the hip, the knee, and the ankle. And especially the knee and the ankle, which we'll focus on today, over 50% of basketball-related injuries happen in the knee and the ankle. All right. So that's kind of our focus point because we're looking at can we prevent some of those injuries from occurring? Okay. So I'm just going to give you a couple uh, ideas about what kind of injuries that we see. Okay. Patellofemoral syndrome. Okay. Tibial tubercle apophysitis, which uh, is also known as Osgood Schlatter's disease. Calcaneal apophysitis is also known as Seaver's disease. Right? We're going away from calling them diseases and calling them apophysitis, which is an injury and inflammation to the area where the tendon inserts on the bone. Right? And I'll show you some pictures that uh, will give you a good idea of what that looks like. So I'm going to separate the overuse injuries from the traumatic injuries. And the overuse injuries are injuries that are repetitive. You do something over and over and over again and it breaks. So I don't know if you guys ever fiddle or anything like that, but if you take a paper clip and you do this to it about three or four times, what happens? It breaks in your hand. Well, luckily for us, we're not as brittle as a paper clip, but we do get overuse, repetitive motions that then cause things to get irritated, and then you have inflammation, you have pain, uh, things like that. So. Really, it's doing too much too fast. And we see a lot of injuries early in the season from either from lack of conditioning or we see injuries towards the end of the season when somebody's played on multiple teams and they've you know, gotten a certain volume of work, haven't had rest, injuries occur. And a great um, resource for, for everybody out there is uh, Stop Sports Injuries. And this thing kind of tells you it all. 50% of all injuries sustained by middle and high school students are overuse injuries. Right? So that's a huge number of injuries that we can help at least control a little bit okay, through proper training. And again, I'll go over uh, that with you guys in, uh, as we move along. So here are the two apophysitis type injuries that we see commonly in a young athlete, you don't see these anymore in adults. Okay, Once they stop growing, you stop seeing this kind of injury because the injury occurs because this area, which is called a tibial tubercle, okay, is not hard bone yet in kids. Right? It's a little bit more of a cartilage material. When you have an overuse or a pulling on this ten, you know, the quadriceps is this big muscle in your, you know, your quad muscle here, and it comes over the top of the kneecap and attaches down at the bone right here. That pulling from jumping a lot, running a lot, 
will then irritate this area. When it irritates this area, the body says, hmm, let me figure out a way to protect it. So how does it protect it? It, it gets the inflammation and it actually puts down a little bit of extra cartilage bone, okay? So if you ever look at somebody's knees and you see a couple big bumps on them in adults, you know that they had this uh, apophysitis when they were younger, all right? So, and it's pretty painful. It's very rare when the, when the tendon actually just pulls it off and, and takes the bone with it, but it has happened, okay? Usually they just have this big bump, it's red, it's irritated. You, they don't want you to touch it, all right? The other apophysitis we see is uh, calcaneal apophysitis, which is, again, there's a little growth area right here. And this is your Achilles that attaches into that growth area Again, from jumping, pushing off, running, again, a traction type injury where it's pulling, 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 pulling. The body will respond to that stimulus, give you pain and inflammation there. Um, and so those are the two types of apophysitis we see pretty commonly in young athletes. Okay. Yes. It is not genetic. Okay. It just, it's just from, if you're a couch potato, you'll never get this. Okay, these are only injuries that occur because you're actually working the muscle and it's pulling on the areas that are, you know, it's kind of like the, um, the weakest link. It's just going to pull on whatever area is the weakest link. In kids, the weakest link happens to be where the tendon attaches to the bone. In adults, you just mm -hmm. rupture things. Um, you know, this, the Achilles tendon, you know, this is like a 30 to 40 year old, you know, weekend warrior type injury where this uh, this um, tendon just tears apart. Okay, so that's not good either. Yes. So the stretching the quad and does that relieve that? You want to be careful with the stretching with this type of injury because again, you're you're trying to not pull it too hard. So you don't want it to necessarily pull right on the areas that are painful, but you do want to stretch the muscles out. Okay. The other kind of major injury that we see that's an overuse injury is the dreaded patellofemoral syndrome, otherwise just known as, people just call it knee pain, okay? I'm sure everybody has had some type of knee pain at some point. There are a lot of different reasons that you get knee pain. So, you know, if you go take your young athlete to the pediatrician and they say, okay, you have knee pain or patellofemoral syndrome, they'll send you, you know, write you a prescription, send you to physical therapy. The job as a physical therapist is to then figure out why is there knee pain? It's not just you have knee pain, so here's what you're going to do and you're good. Okay? We have to figure out, is this kneecap moving in the correct, in the correct uh, direction? Okay? There's a bunch of other attachments. Okay? You have your IT band okay, that attaches on the side here. Okay? You have various ligaments that attach to the kneecap, right? So there's a lot of different reasons why you get patellofemoral syndrome. It's not just, I have knee pain, so I'm, you know, the job is to do X, Y, Z, okay? There's a lot of similarities in the exercise regime that you're going to, uh, regimen that you're going to do, but for the most part, we are going to decipher why you have knee pain, okay? Is it a mechanical issue? Is it how you move? Is it that you're just doing too much and you've irritated the structures? So a lot of different, um, you know, investigation in order to figure out what is the cause. Because if you don't know the cause of something, you can't fix it. All right. So that's that's the that's the job of a physical therapist. Now we move to the common traumatic injuries. The worst of all, AC injuries to the ACL. Okay. This has been a big topic of conversation in the, um, in the uh, sports medicine world. We're still trying to figure out, you know, the, the, the causes of an ACL tear and how to prevent them. Okay? It's obviously not perfect science yet because I'm seeing ACL tears in kids as young as eight years old. Okay? So uh, it's, it's a problem. And the, and the problem with the ACL injury is that the ACL, because of the, where it lives in the knee, it doesn't heal. So the only option really on a tear is to have surgery. Okay? That surgery involves replacing 
the ligament with something else, either a cadaver or your own tissues. Um, and it involves a long, arduous rehab process of nine to 12 months, all right? So it's a good thing I see all these young athletes out here today because the goal is to not have you come to the sports medicine center with this type of injury, okay? And then the other injury type of injury you're gonna see, which is the most common amongst basketball players, are ankle sprains, all right? We'll talk about that more in, in detail. So ACL injuries, 70% are non-contact. So you can be running and cutting, you can be landing from a jump, boom, ACL goes out. And you've seen it, I don't know how many of you have seen it, but it's usually just somebody all of a sudden, they're running and they fall down and grab their knee, okay? That's, that's kind of a telltale sign like, uh-oh, something bad is happening here. Um, 30% are contact. Somebody fouls you, you get hit from behind, someone falls and lands into your, into your leg. There's not a lot you can do about that. Okay, it's, it, you know, it happens. Again, that's why we exist. I would prefer that the non-contact injuries, the overuse injuries, that we work on this kind of education, we do training so that we don't have to work with those athletes and we can work with them on the wellness side of things and then deal with the ones who, you know, you can't do anything about, All right? So that's our goal as, as physical therapists and in a sports medicine center. <laughs> the other thing if, uh, that they've found is that ACL injured athletes often recall some type of unanticipated event, you know, some type of perturbation or someone bumping them or a loss of concentration, okay? And a, and a lot of times this can happen when you're fatigued. Okay? If you're tired, um, you know, you've been playing a lot, your, your body hasn't had recovery time, that's when you kind of lose this concentration, your body doesn't respond quite as quickly, and this is the chance of having this type of injury. Now, the incidence of ACL injuries, there's, there's been quite a few studies that have looked at incidences between uh, female and males, and it's anywhere from four to eight in some studies, two to 10 in other studies, but what, it, what it, all those studies are telling us is there's a significant risk in female athletes, right? And I can see, you know, we have a, quite a few female athletes in here today, and so this is, this is good information for you. So, you, you know, you're at risk, but I'm gonna sh give you some tips and tricks on the things that you can do to help you so that you're not one of these statistics. Okay? Again, the high risk group is females about 15 to 20 years old. And each year, one out of 100 high school female athletes and one of 10 college female athletes experience an ACL injury. Right, so, so pretty common. What are the problems that cause, might cause you to have this type of injury? Well, your foot pronates, okay? So that you can see if, if you see somebody's foot and their arch kind of falls inward. And everything's connected. So this, if you look at this, is, this, is a, this is a chain of events that are occurring. So your knee, your foot collapses in, your knee rotates in, your hip rotates in. Okay? And we, when we use this term medial collapse, okay? so everything is going inward, it puts all these stresses on the ACL. Okay? That twisting inward motion is going to put a lot of stress on the ACL, and it's not designed to withstand that. Okay? Going through here, we have ankle sprains. If you've had an ankle sprain, you can remember this kind of ugly coloring here, <laughs> yellow and red and black and green. And then you start seeing it down the foot and up the leg, okay? And that's just the swelling in the, in, in the um, edema kind of spreading out, okay? So usually the injury is right on the ligaments there. You can see in the inversion sprain, that first one where they point to the tear, that's the, the first ligament there the ATFL or the anterior talofibular ligament, down 
here, let me see if I have my, right here, coming up and down is a calcaneal fibular ligament, and then you also have a posterior talofibular ligament, okay? A lot of the ankle sprains are either tear this um, ligament or this one, okay, the first two kind of get the brunt of it, all right? You can also have eversion ankle sprains where you tear the ligaments on the inside of your ankle, and then you also have high ankle sprains or syndesmotic, which tear this part, uh, this ligament right here, okay? So the tibiofibular ligament there. And that is takes a long time to heal because think about every time you step, all these bones are pushing right up into that area and it causes the two bones to kind of separate a little bit, okay? And so that's really painful and it takes a while to heal. All right, did you have one? No, no, I, I know a lot of people. I know a lot of people. Oh, okay. And you wish, you wish as people step on the, on the top part of the ankle. Yes, yes. Football, it's more common than football, though. Right. So why are angles, ankles such a common site for injury? Um, a quarter of them are, uh, it's a quarter of all musculoskeletal injuries are in the ankle, and out of those ankle injuries, 75% of them are sprains, okay, so we see that quite a bit. It's 10 to 30% of sports-related injuries are due to ankle trauma, happens to about a million people a year, and unfortunately here, 40% of ankle sprains lead to chronic problems. So you, chronic means it just, it's, it's, there's some type of either disability or injury that occurs further on in life, okay? So recently, um, they did a study on mice where they sprained their ankles, which means they, they tore their ligaments, and, and then they let them heal, and they they let them live their normal lives. And they found that those mice over time were much more sedentary. They didn't use the exercise wheel as much. So there's, there's problems of, you know, you have an ankle sprain. And what I see a lot is somebody has an ankle sprain and, the, you know, they, ah, it's going to get better in two weeks, right? And so you just let it rest for two weeks and then it feels better. And then you go back in and play, okay? The problem is about a few weeks later, a month later, two or three months later, they have another ankle sprain, okay? Then it's worse, and that's when they come see me. <laughs> so ideally, if you have an ankle sprain, you wanna get it looked at, you wanna make sure you go through the rehabilitation process so you don't have this chronic kind of problem, all right? So this is a good one for, for young athletes, because, you know, take a couple of weeks rest, and then, and then try it out again, and you'll find that that, that becomes a, an issue. So why do we need to learn proper mechanics? Okay, so we've talked about kind of the different injuries that are um, happening in young athletes. But why is it important? Well, if you're competitive and you want to play, you know, or if you just want to, you know, play recreationally, you want to have your full potential. Okay, most young athletes, if you, if they, if they've done studies on it, and they say, why do you want to play your sport? Why do you want to play basketball? And for the majority, it's they want to have fun. Right. Well, if you're getting injured, it's not so fun anymore. Right. Um, you want to make sure that you're utilizing as much strength and power as you have. Now, you know, if you take these, the, the, these little guys up front, they're not, you know, they haven't, they don't have the, the testosterone in their body to, to build up muscles. They don't, you know, they're not, they haven't fully grown yet. So they're not, you know, but they still have strength and power with what, with the muscles that they currently have. So it's about utilization of the muscle in these young athletes rather than I'm just going to make your muscles really big so that then you're going to be stronger. Okay. That's not the point of, of physical therapy. That's not the point of our athlete development program. It's to, to get them stronger by using what they have and then building on top of that. Right. Um, 
you want to be efficient with your sports, and you know you want to improve, you know, jump higher, run faster, right? Um, play better. And if you do that, then less bench, more play, right? That's the goal. So let's look at some. So this is a, a, a motion. This is a video a video capture from our lab. And so you can see there's little markers on the knees, and then we run them through a whole gamut of, of, of testing, including uh, jumping, cutting, uh, running, um, uh, and then it's like some step downs and different activities to see where deficits occur and how we then use those, um, use those uh, findings to help correct their mechanics. So, if you look at faulty jump mechanics, what do we normally see? We see poor trunk control, which is the trunk either lists to one side or you know they're too tall or they're, they're leaning over too far. You're going to see a, a pelvic drop, so you're going to see one pelvis lower than the other. You'll see that knee valgus and that medial collapse I'm talk we've talked about, kind of where the knees roll in. The hips go in and the foot pronates. You can see that collapse on the inside there. Okay. So this is somebody who we're going to work on to try to get that position better when they land and when they jump. Okay. And that occurs a lot of times on both the takeoff and then also the landing. Okay. So you have two instances where you're you're doing bad things to your to your body. Okay. For each jump. Okay. The other problem with the landing is when you land you put multiple times your body weight with each landing, okay? So now you're putting, you know, if she's 100 pounds on a double leg landing, she might be putting a couple hundred pounds on this unstable structure, right? So you're going to compound the problems. Now we have an athlete who, this is one of my athletes that I uh, worked with here, um, he had an ACL tear reconstruction, and this is about a year out, and you can see, I don't have his old result picture, but he was doing that same thing, where the knees were doing this, and you can see really nice now, the knees are in line with the toes, the knees are in line with the hips, right, so training does work, right, kids, I love working with kids, because they can, they're, their body and their brains react really nicely to training. Okay, they don't have like as ingrained habits as you know as a, a older athletes. All right, so again, really nice to see this kind of alignment. All right. So here's an example of a broad jump. I'm just going to show you some anatomy video here, and you can see. Let's see if it'll loop. So we'll start from the beginning again. And you can see as, as this model comes down, look at all of the muscles that are getting used right now. Okay, upper extremity, okay, muscles in your back, your quads, your glutes, okay? And you'll if just, I'm gonna play this a couple times because you wanna look at the glutes, all right? And, and the reason that, you know, as we go forward and talk about exercise and things like that, this is your bread and butter right here, okay? This is your power muscles, okay? If you look at professional athletes, they all have significant girth in their glutes, right? Because that's the power, okay? That's where all that comes from. So you can look at this jump again. You can see that glute fires all the way through, and then as it comes through, it lands. You also use it, okay? So I'll play it again. So you can see how the muscles all fire, quads, glutes, hamstrings, okay, your calves are firing, all right? So fun little thing to see that all these different muscles are working. You know, these are multi-joint movements. Now, this is a vertical jump, pretty similar. This is from the front view. And again... You can see all the muscles firing, okay, including 
the abdominal muscles, your quads are firing, glutes, hamstrings, all right? Everything has to work together. And that's, a, that's another, you know, problem with these young athletes is they're trying to grow, they're growing, and now you have this coordination you're trying to do between all of these different muscle groups. You can see all the greens firing, different ones have to turn red and, and stop firing, okay? And if they miss that coordination, okay, and their muscles are firing incorrectly, you're, then you're gonna start seeing problems, okay? And then here's the vertical jump again from the posterior view. Again, look at that glute, firing, 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 landing and firing, okay? And again, the calf has to work as well. So, all of that information, how do you reduce your injury risk? Work, okay, you have to do work, okay? You have to, when before you play, you have to warm up properly. You have to use proper mechanics. And how you get there is by training the neuromuscular system don't forget about the core muscles, and it's just practice, right? Every study that they've done that um, involves training, it's gonna take you know an eight or, eight or nine week training program to get you results. Right? So we'll talk about the dynamic warm-up. What it does is it actively prepares the muscles required for sport demands. It increases your core body temperature. It increases your heart rate and blood flow. It increases the rate of muscle of, and flow of muscle contraction and efficiency. Okay. So here's your top 10, and we'll go through these um, during our, our lab here. I mean, we'll have a few of our young athletes run, you know, run in front here. So first thing, you want to break a sweat for about five to seven minutes, and then there's some of, you know, and if you, you know, each coach might have a variety of different dynamic warm-ups. The ideas are to figure out what muscles you use within the sport and to do stretch and to actively stretch them, okay? You'll see uh, coaches or athletes and even professional athletes, you know, before a game, they'll sit there and they'll stretch, right? You're like, okay, that's, that's pretty cool that they're doing that. But they're holding their stretches. If you, if you hold your stretch, the studies have shown that there's a little bit of a weakening of the muscles, okay? So we never, you know, teach our athletes to, to do static stretching before they play, all right? It should be dynamic, active stretching, okay? So we do like a high knees run, butt kicks, side shuffle. We do some hip openers, back pedals. Frankenstein marches, walking lunges, little Z runs, and some star jumps, okay? So a variety of, of different activities, and we'll go over that um, in, the, in the exercise section here. We look at technique training, okay? How's the body alignment? Again, if you have a young athlete that's interested in um, going to our motion lab, you can get um, you can get uh, a motion analysis um, if you're in the middle of physical therapy or, you know, or if you have some type of injury or pain or anything like that. A lot of times um, the doctors will refer you to get an uh, evaluation, which can include a motion analysis um, uh, evaluation. Okay. So again, if you look at this athlete, just wonderful position here. The spine is erect. Can't see his shoulders that well, but his chest, his knee is over his foot. Okay. He's nice and straight there. Uh, we, we talk a lot about landing softly. I don't know if you know any of the athletes in here, but if, if you can hear them, you know, when your eyes are closed, running down the court or anything like that, they might be landing too heavy. Okay, so you'll hear that. Okay, and again, is that knee positioned with good alignment of the foot? Okay, so. So here we're gonna look at some, some movement training. You can see squat training. Athletes standing about hip width apart, okay? 
and then they're going to go into that squat, and you're going to again see that knee is in line with the toes, right? From the side view, you're going to see a nice erect position in their back, their butt's back, their knees are not past their toes, okay? And a squat will give you tons of information. If somebody has a tight ankle, you can see that angle here with the ankle, they can't do a squat very well, okay? So if I look at a squat, I can give you a good amount of information about what your athlete's doing, okay? Did the knees go in? Are they not firing their hips as much, all right? So you can really pull a lot from these multi-joint movements. And then we talk about strength training. Now, once you get past the squat and you're like, okay, I've gotten that squat down, can they do a single leg squat? Okay, we have, we have athletes, basketball players come in and they're like, oh yeah, I squat 350, no problem. And then you say, okay, can you do a single leg squat? And they start falling over and their knees are collapsing, everything like that. You're at risk for an injury. You're a basketball player, you land and you jump off one leg you know, a lot during your sport and you can't do this. I don't care if you can lift 350 pounds and do a squat because you're gonna be seeing me next month with a torn ACL, okay? So, you know, so then we, then we work on that. Here you can see a side lunge, again, straight position here, the knee is again in line with the toes, okay? And again, the knee doesn't go past the toes. Okay. Some other exercises. Thinking about the hip work, remember we looked at the glutes on those jumping videos and you can see the glutes were a big part of that. So working bridges, lifting your butt up and doing clamshells, okay? A clamshell, if you look at that position with the knees opening up, it's similar to what you're doing when you're squatting and you have to keep your knees apart, right? So very similar position, you're just in a, in a sideline position. And then here's a heel raise, which we, she has triple extension. The ankle is pointed, the knee is straight, the back is straight, okay? So nice position. And anybody know what this kind of position mimics? Some running and then a layup, right? You come up, right? So again, we're looking at sports specific. You know, even though this is just, you know, like, oh, okay, I know heel raise, right? But how can we make this more sports specific? So they, they go up and down on the calf, like you have the leg raise? Correct. So, yep, just, you know, when you know when I go up, it's boom, right? And you're just going up and down and working that. So you, you got your, your hips and your, your quad muscles and your hamstrings working. And then we also look at core training, okay? So they've done a study of nine weeks of core training. And they found that it was similarly effective to leg strength training or a combination of leg and core strength training for enhancing vertical, okay? So, you know, you have the athletes and they say, I wanna jump higher. You know, usually they come in, they're like, I wanna jump higher. That's like, I wanna dunk a basketball, you know, or something like that. And, and then you say, okay, well, you should do these things, exercises and strengthening. And you also need to work your core and they're like all confused. They're like, shouldn't I like practice jumping in order to be able to dunk a basketball? It's like, well, Really, they found that if you work your core muscles, you can also jump higher, all right? So, so it's the whole combination. Again, when you guys saw the, the anatomy videos, you could see the abs and, and the back muscles all working together to help propel you, okay, and control your movement. So you can do planks, side planks, and then a little Superman here with the ball. This is a little bit more advanced. You could just do it from the floor, all right? Flexibility training, you know, with young athletes, their, um, their bones are growing, right? And their bones are growing fast, and then their muscles have to catch up, okay? So you'll find uh, a lot of our young athletes who are in physical therapy, and they haven't done research that says, if you're tight, you're gonna get injured, but, you know, anecdotally from my practice, a lot of the kids who are coming into physical therapy are tight, <laughs> so. Um, we work on flexibility training, okay? You work on the hip flexors, the hamstrings, the calves, the quads. You know, imagine these kids sit all day long, 
Okay, so they sit for how, how many how many hours do you in school? Six, eight, right? Seven hours a day, and you're sitting just like you're sitting now, kind of slumped over, and these muscles, you know, get tight, right? And then you say, okay, now go out there and jump up and down, right? Is this yours? And then you say, jump up and down. Well, what happens when your muscles are tight here and you try to jump? It doesn't work as well. Something's pulling you back, okay? You also have to press push harder, and that's when you can get those traction-type injuries also in the hip, okay? So dynamic warm-up flexibility is important. So here's some examples of flexibility training. You have a quad stretch, making sure the knee's in line here with the ground. You have a hamstring stretch, keeping the knee straight. This also gives you a little bit of a, of a calf stretch because the foot's getting pulled. Okay. Here she's, she's bringing forward in the hip right here. The hip flexor is getting a little stretch. And that's an important one for basketball players. Okay. So if you have that tight hip, you're not going to be able to explode off that leg. Okay. And then working that calf. Yeah. A study in 2010 looked at a balanced training program for preventing ankle injury. So let's say I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine young athletes here. So if I told you that if you guys did a nine week balanced training program, that somebody in here would be able to prevent an ankle injury, wouldn't that be pretty cool? Right? Wouldn't it make you want to do it? Yeah. So, balanced training program, and it's simple exercises. Now, you got not not everybody has a balance beam at home, but you know you could do this on a, you know, find a find a curb or something, right? So, you know, these are basic exercises. You walk slowly back and forth on a balance beam. Okay. One step, three seconds, and then you go to the next one. Right? Just simple balance work. Okay, you're standing on an exercise mat, okay, um, and you're just moving a little bit, okay? You're jumping from one leg to the other, okay? You're walking up and down on an incline service and dribbling a ball, okay? That's, that might be a little challenging for you outside of here. Um, you're, you're, holding, you're standing on one leg and pushing a, a strap with another leg, okay? or you're standing on one leg and throwing a ball. Okay, so a lot of these are, are, are simple exercises that can be done, and then you vary it by increasing it, and then here you start just, you know, like in basketball, you're, you know, when you're in air, someone's gonna bump you and things like that, so you have to be ready for that landing. Okay, but pretty good. Seven basketball players, I'm gonna prevent one ankle injury. Okay, that's real money there. <laughs> that's money in the healthcare system that's, you know, that's time that you actually get to participate in your sport. And right? so a lot of a lot of good benefits that are coming. So again, let's just review neuromuscular training. We're talking about breaking down that jump and land mechanics. And again, we all have this technology now with the you know with the phones. You know, you could look at your athlete easily, have them jump up and down ten times, record them on your phone. You can even do slow motion. You can see are their knees going in. Okay, that's that's you know that's pretty that's pretty basic. You know how you correct it might be a little bit harder, but you know you can at least identify like, hey, there might be a problem here. Do I need to seek professional medical advice? Once you get that, then you start practicing the proper techniques. It's all about repetition. Okay. When when little kids, um, infants, and toddlers. They have to practice something two or three thousand times to be to get proficient at it. Okay? And you, if you see a toddler, you're like, they have really good squat, right? They get right down there, boom, they're playing, they get back up because they're doing it over and over and over. As we get start getting into this age group that that is you know a majority of our group here, you start seeing a lot of sitting, playing with their phones. Um, and that then you lose kind of that they're growing, okay, and you kind of lose that that stability and that and that um, and that work there. And then again, we're talking about you know we have to do stuff with with specificity to sport. Okay, basketball is a sport that involves a lot of different movements. Okay, and uh, you also want to look at you know first you try 
you tell them, okay, I want you to do this, and then at some point you have to make it game-like. I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to give you that cue and you have to go. Right? But because of this sport-specific demand for basketball, the research so far hasn't shown that there's been a, a specific success with uh, preventing ACL tears or injuries in, in basketball players. So that's, that's still to come. The studies have shown that there's, there's been a general improvement in uh, decreasing the risk of injury overall, but it's not specific for ACL yet. So I think that research is going to continue to be developed. And, and, you know, if you guys, you know, when I do this talk again in five years or two years or next year, hopefully they're coming up with more research that's going to say, here is the program that you should use for your basketball athletes. So your take-home message from Steve Kerr is you want to include a dynamic warm-up. Okay? You want to make sure that your squat mechanics, that's kind of like your, your, your basic movement pattern. Everybody who comes into our physical therapy clinics gets squat mechanics training because okay? it's so important. Your core can give you more. Right? It's going to help you jump higher. And really, you have to practice. If you don't do it, then you know it, it won't change. Right. Any questions? Anything? All right. Who wants to? Who, oh yes. Uh, that's a little bit more related to the uh, to the strength training. Uh huh. What age is it okay for like kids to like start jumping low for weight and those type of things? Any age is appropriate for strength training. Mm -hmm because you have to think about the load they can handle. Okay, So if you're doing jump rope and things like that, or body weight work, not a problem at all. Because they're used to moving their body weight in, in a lot of different positions. Um, if you load them up too much and they're breaking, their mechanics are breaking down, then, you're, then, that's, you know, then you're, that's just too much. So you kind of have to gauge what they can handle. Usually, um, you know, pre-puberty, uh, you're looking at repetition, body weight, okay? Because even if you loaded them up with a ton of weight, they're not going to hypertrophy at that age, okay? You have to get into pu puberty, get the testosterone levels up, and then you might, then you'll get more muscle hypertrophy. But so if they want to try to both legs, if they do lift their body weight. Correct, okay. correct. But if you, if you start really loading them up, then there's a chance that you can, and, and what happens when you load somebody up too much anyways is that their mechanics always break down, okay? You could have a perfect squat, and then I, I, would, I could keep adding weight until I could find the weight where your, your, your body's going to break down, the mechanics will break down. So it's, it's all about making sure that, you know, you, it's the safety first, okay? Use pain as your guide. Like, if it's painful, your body's probably telling you, hey, that's a little bit too much. squats they can do with weights? Yeah, you can, you know, little handheld weights or things like that. They can they can start practicing squats. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Let me pull. Let me see. Real quick. What's happening here? All right. So what we're gonna do now is let's go through some of those. Let's go through a little dynamic warm up. Okay, so who, any volunteers that want to run through a little dynamic warm-up? Come on. Come on, Mira. Show us the dynamic warm-up here. All right. Come on, Mira. You too. We need, we need two up here. So I'm going to go back to the dynamic warm-up here. So we'll pretend that they broke a sweat, okay? <laughs> They've been running around for five minutes. All right. So, Mary, let's do, let's practice um, a, a little knee hug with a heel raise. All right. So, so go ahead and do that. And then you're gonna follow her all the way. You just goes down a little bit, right? So you can see you, you're gonna hold that knee. You're gonna go up on that tiptoe. Okay. Good. And you're gonna watch for things like where that knee wants to kind of buckle forward. Okay. Yep, and then you're going to come back. Okay, so the knee stays nice and tall. You're going to get your head towards the ceiling. You get a little bit of balance work here, all right? Activating the calves. 
you're getting a little stretch in the glutes. So again, these are multi-joint movements that you're doing to warm up all the muscles. Okay. What about a Frankenstein march? Nice and tall, you're gonna kick your leg up. Okay, keep the knees straight. Good. Again, you're gonna see things like where the kids kind of lean back because they're tight, their knee bends. Okay, so again, we're, you know, every movement that somebody does, you can really look at and see where they're breaking down and, and what possible deficits that they have. Yes? What do you, on the first one, you said the knee buckles, what do you mean? So they'll do this where they go here and then it'll kind of like, the knee will kind of ride forward like that. It's because they don't have the stability in their hip. So what they're doing is then they kind of get into this kind of position. All right. um, and then what about a walking lunge, Mira? Can you do a walking lunge there? And again, with a lunge, lunge and squat, you're looking at are the knees in line with the toes? Okay. A lot of times you'll see this kind of thing where they're stepping and their knees do this kind of position. Okay. Again, that same pronation, knee goes in, the hip's not working. All right. Very good. Watch that knee. <laughs> All right. And then what about little high knees? Okay, you can just go down. High knees jog. Again, now here we're getting those knees up, activating muscles in the front, stretching a little bit actively the muscles in the back. Okay, and then what about butt kicks? Very good. <laughs> Okay, and then a little side shuffle. There you go. And then side shuffle back. Yes? Do you see any, um, do you typically see any uh, deficiencies in the side shuffles and the butt kicks and those kinds of things, or is that really just circulation? Uh, they're a little bit of just an active stretch, but sometimes you'll see, you know, how they're landing. They might be landing too hard. You'll see if, um, if somebody comes from an injury where they're, uh, they've injured their calf or something like that, you'll see the push off and they'll land kind of with a flat foot. So there's still, you know, every movement you can see if there's something wrong. Doesn't mean there, you know, that every movement has something wrong, but it can. Um, and then we'll skip the Z run, but you can do like a little star jump. So you do that, it's like, you know, you can just jump to the different directions. Okay, so. Those are, you, guys are, you guys are good. Thank you for your participation. Very nice. A hand of, round of applause there. Um, and then, you know, we've looked at this stuff, but, you know, if anybody wants to, you know, we're getting close to the end here, but if anybody wants to practice in the front, you know, we can look at some squat, squat training, lunge, lunge mechanics, the heel raise, um, and then some core stability work. All right. And then always that jumping and landing Sorry, flexibility work, and then looking at jumping and landing um, and how everybody um, with the knees going in and, and, uh, and how you land with proper form. Okay? Any other questions? Yes? The box jumps and the kettlebells uh -huh. are pretty good for explosion too. Yeah, you know, what I, I, what I always say is there are, there's really not a bad exercise. With the technique of Yes. Okay? So, because you know, that's that's the main thing that you know that everyone asks is, well, can I do this or can I do that? And as long as you're doing it with the correct loads, the correct mechanics, you're not overdoing it. Okay. So if, if you're like, oh, you know, you get athletes that are like, oh, I, you know, I squat every day. Well, even if your mechanics are perfect and you do something every day, that's probably not helpful to you. Okay. You might not be gaining. You're not giving your time, muscles time to recover. Okay, so that's, you know, that can be, you know, anything can, anything can be bad for you and anything can be, you know, most things can be good for you. So, you had a question? Yes? Um, the motion lab, do, do people come in and, and do that without injury and just to, for efficiency and Yes. Yes. So the, the motion lab is, you know, there's a variety of things you can test in the motion lab. Um, we, you know, they do a lower extremity or ACL type screens. They do running analysis. They're, um, you know, doing uh, throwing analysis, that kind of stuff. So, a lot of different, um, you know, pretty much any movement you can analyze and see is there something that's that's um, not 
working correctly. Yeah, are doing going better. Yes. Can you get insurance to pay for that if you don't have any insurance? The the insurance companies at this point are paying for physical therapy evaluations. So if you don't have an injury, you know that's questionable. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I thank you so much for coming in. I think um, you know because you guys are coming in and thinking about this stuff that's going to help in the long run, you know, keep your athletes out of this, you know, sports medicine center, unless you want to do sports training programs. We have, um, you know, training programs most evenings, Pilates, we have a functional strength, agility, and speed training classes. We have group trainings, educational events. If you have teams or anything that are interested in having us come out and do seminars or lectures, we are, we, we want to be educating the community rather than just working in the clinic. All right. So if you have if you have, you know, you have my card in in the folder, please let me know if there's anything I can do to help you um, get your athletes uh, in the game. All right. And there's evaluation forms. If you guys can please fill that out, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. So I was told when I was young that I had eyes good flatters. Mm -hmm. I thought it was always oh, a thank growth you. issue. Like it grew really fast. I mean, it can be, you know, the it can be that when you're because you're growing so fast, you get tight. Right. And then when you're putting the forces on there, it's pulling on the area. But really, it's it's always a traction injury. So it's a pulling of the thing. You know, your quad your quad has to be pretty tight to just like if you were to just like not do anything and just grow. Yeah. It's it's unlikely. You actually have to put force on it. Is it it's more in my understanding it's more unusual girls than boys. Uh, we like, see it a lot in boys. Yeah. But um yeah, I it's just not having the big big bumps under that I still do. Yeah. My knees and being very weak. <laughs> so interesting. Thank you. Oh,